Happy 4th of July, everybody. Got that out of the way. So I'm going to uh, read out of Psalm 118. Philip, can I have some light? Uh, you're on. <laughs> no, I... Oh, no, yeah, sure. Thank you. No problem. We're getting at that age. Psalm 118, first verse. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. Let Israel now say, his mercies endure forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercies endure forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercies endure forever. How about this? Go off script a little bit. Let the Lord of Harvest say, his mercy endure forever. Amen. I called on, on the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me, and they, they surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, but the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were, they were quenched like fires, uh, fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteousness shall declare I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Yeah. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day of the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endure forever. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that, uh, uh, that you are with us. Thank you, Lord God, that you have delivered us, that you have picked us up by the miry clays. And thank you, Lord, by destroying our enemies, you bring salvation to our enemies, Lord God. That is how you destroy your enemies, and we thank you, Lord God. Send salvation, Lord God. Send grace, send mercy, right, Lord God, because your mercies, they endure forever. Be with us right now, Lord God. Be glorified. We glorify your holy name this morning in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. <sighs> Praise God, everybody. Amen. Thank God. I just thank God for his, his sweet, sweet spirit. Thank you, Jesus. My brothers and sisters at home, you know, we thank God um, for what he's, what he's given us because he's given us so much. You know, I think we have a tendency to forget sometimes, you know, through all of going through with our children and bills and issues with the house and job. Sometimes we forget. But I just want us just to take a moment and just remember, you know, five, six, a year ago, what 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 God has done in just months. You know, I really thank him. You know, just just take a moment and just look back six months ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and just remember, it's something that he's done, something powerful, something that he's done in your life. And just thank him and just give him a shout. Just, just give him a shout. Jesus. Because a couple of months ago, he was in that car when my son's car flipped over a couple of times. Man, God. <laughs> Woo. Man. Jesus. We, we, we thank you for your sacrificial ways. For your, you laying down your life for ours to be better, Lord. That's what communion, you know, it means. I have three three little interjections here because I look at it as It was in the past because it happened so many years ago. But then him dying and us partaking is for the present too. It's not only for then, but it's for the present, it's for now. And then it's also for the future. Let me just share the scripture and then I'm going to share just a little insight here. Father God, we thank you so much. Lord God, this is your body. You know, this is your body and your blood. And Lord, You said, Jesus, this is my body, which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. Lord God, we partake of your body. We share in with your death and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Let's partake of his body. Thank you, Jesus. And in the same way, <laughs> he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink whenever you drink it do it in remembrance of me we partake and we remember yes. Jesus thank you Point one, through the Lord's Supper, we are confronted 
with the saving death of Christ and its redemptive significance to our lives. That's past. See, it's hard to imagine sometimes that he took on the sins of the world. He, he, he said, lay it on me. That was powerful. Yeah. Lay it on me. Because sometimes I think back at things that happened to me and things I did, and I still cry about still have a soft heart about it. Even though Jesus said, Bird, I, I took that. I take that. I, I, I took that from you. Don't, don't pick that back up. But man, just to know that he handled that for me, oh, it's a blessing. It makes you cry. It makes you say, oh, Lord Jesus. That was the past. The present. The Lord's Supper is a fellowship with Christ and a participation in the benefits of his sacrificial death as well as fellowship with other members of the body of Christ. His death represents the new covenant, a new way, a new beginning, a fresh start, you know, and you know, we have to be so thankful. You know, I, I was listening to the Christian radio station the other day. I couldn't catch it because, you know, I was on lunch. And uh, the guy was coming up and he was in and, 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 and the announcer, the guy that was that was over the show. He was like, man, this guy is coming up. I got a, I got a powerful, powerful. Man, a guy that's coming up and he's going to talk to us about. how sacrificial Jesus' death was. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I wish I didn't have to go back into work. Because I was on lunch. And, I, and he was like, man, there's so many points that this man points out about uh, him dying and him laying down his life. You know, we all should just be thankful even every day when we wake up and we're going through the trials and tribulations, we still should be thankful that we are alive. Yes, amen. Man, we should be thankful. Oh, God, I've got one more point. The future. The Lord's Supper is a foretaste of the future. Future kingdom of God. And the future Messianic banquet where all believers will be with the Lord. Yes. See, at one time, you know, I used to be, you know, worried about, you know, dying and when I would leave here and how it would be. And, you know, um, I don't want to, uh, you know, wonder what's going to happen with my kids and, you know, I want certain kids to get this, that, and the other. And the Lord said, don't you, don't you, don't worry about that. That's going to be our time. That's going to be the time that you transfer from here to be with him. You know, and that's going to be a powerful time, Peter. We're here, we have to deal with what we have to deal with our families and our loved ones. But man, I thank, I thank Jesus for making it so much easier. I try to tell people on a daily basis, those of you that are at home and those of you that are here, you know, I, I try to tell them God has a plan. Right. He's got a plan for your life. <laughs> You know, and they say, well, man, how do you, you know, how, you know, how can you speak so highly? How can you speak so in depth about Christ? I said, man, you don't understand, man. 
I was an ugly guy. I did ugly things. And one day, I said it didn't happen just overnight. It happened over a period of time and I didn't know it. But it came one morning, I woke up and I knew I wasn't the same person. It's Jesus' redemptive work. And as we continue to take the sacrifice you know what I'm saying? He cleans us. He cleanses us. He helps straighten us out. Yes. And we just have to be thankful that he does it and that he takes that he takes that time. Yeah. Because we all can look back and say, Woo, man, I used to, I remember I used to do this, that, and the other. Yeah. I'm talking to people about drinking and talking to people about smoking. And I told them, I said, man, God, God will deliver you from that. You have to trust and believe. He's here. You out, you, you at home. You know, if you're sick, just believe. Yeah. He died for that. If you smoke or drink or drugs or want to get rid of some a bad attitude or steal things in your heart that's trying to hold on to you, Trust the Lord. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice, for your blood, and for your body, and for making a way for us, Jesus. You made a way for us to be able to, to, to fellowship with you and fellowship with each other without looking at each other like, oh, he a sinner, he does that, or she's a sinner, she does that. No, we're all sinners, Lord, and you straightened it out for us, God. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your sacrifice, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue. This is part three on the church in Philadelphia. I thought, well, I, I'll be able to do this in one or two weeks. Well, we're barely scratching the surface. There's so much here on the church in Philadelphia, and we just, just want to hear what the Lord has to say, so we'll take our time. <clears throat> Well, so let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Fifth of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. The second one mentioned in chapter 3. We begin in Revelation 3, 7. And the message to that church goes through to verse 13. We've looked at in the, the previous two messages. First of all, we've looked to the image that we see of Jesus, the way Jesus is revealed, particularly to Philadelphia. As we've said, each church has a unique aspect of Jesus that it is to bear witness to. Each church has a, has a picture of Jesus that empowers it and shapes its destiny. Each church has its own challenges, its own pathway to victory, its own pathway to overcoming for the Lord. And that again shows us no single church has all of Jesus. We're not just talking about local churches. Of course, then it was local churches in the first century. You had uh, one church per city then. Well, we have one church per block right now. Uh, we have an, all kinds of denominations, all kinds of traditions, all kinds of perspectives, all kinds of trajectories. But what was true then is true now. No single church or group of churches has all of Christ. And that's important to see. And yet each church is called to live up to its particular expertise. Each church is called to bear witness to its particular 
vision of Jesus Christ. But each church is to understand that the fullness of Christ is bigger than itself. Each church begins with an exhortation to the angel of the church in Philadelphia in verse 7 or to the angel of the church in Sardis, verse 1 of chapter 3, or to the angel of the church in Laodicea, verse 14. Each one begins with a particular vision of Jesus, but notice what all seven end with. And if you look at verse 13, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need to be aware of what God has shown us and committed to us and be faithful to that, nothing more, nothing less. We are not the complete Christ, not our local church, not our uh, apostolic network that we're involved in, not our denomination. We are not the whole church. But we are to be aware of what the Spirit is saying to the other churches. And so, so you see the, the genius of the way the Lord and the Holy Spirit has things set up for individual churches. We know what we're called to do and we embrace it. But we are aware of what our other brothers and sisters in Christ have that we don't have. And we understand that way. There's a perspective of humility that that creates it. We're not it. In fact, no church is it. Jesus is it. But we understand that together we will see him fulfill his complete purposes in the earth. So the church in Philadelphia sees the Holy One, verse 7, the true one. We went over the second message. We talked about the one who is holy, the one who is true. The first message, we talked about the one who has the key of David. What he unlocks, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. We talked about that key of David in the first message, and that key of David uh, comes from the background of Isaiah chapter 22, where one steward in the house, an unfaithful steward, a steward who utilized his authority to promote himself, is replaced by another steward who seeks the glory of the master's house. We understand that that's bigger than just Shebna and Eliakim. One, one uh, um, being set down and the other being raised up in Isaiah 22. Here, Jesus is called the one who has the key of David. Before Jesus, Israel as a nation is called to have the key of David. They exercise the authority of God in the earth, but they have proven unfaithful. Jesus comes, he is the true Israel. Jesus replaces Israel. And that's the important thing here. There'll be the underlying theme, of course, in verse nine is that those who are of the synagogue of Satan will be replaced by the church in Philadelphia. But the, the bigger picture is Jesus is the one who has the key of David. Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the new Cyrus. Just as Cyrus, uh, when we studied the book of Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, second Isaiah, just as the Lord raises up Cyrus, one emperor to topple a previous empire, Cyrus and the Persians are raised up. They bring down the Babylonians who took God's people into exile. And now this world ruler, Cyrus, opens the door now for Israel to return from the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian exile, and returns to their land and rebuilds the city of Jerusalem and rebuilds the temple, rebuilds Zion, and, and rebuilds the walls around the city. One greater than Cyrus is here. It's Jesus. 
In fact, in the, even in the context of Isaiah 40 through 55, Cyrus is, is, is brought forth as this great, mighty, earthly figure and quickly disappears into the background. He is brought up as great, not to demonstrate that world rulers are great. He's raised up and brought forth to show that the Lord controls human history. The Lord puts one empire up, brings it down, puts another empire up, and then that empire and that leader fades into the background, and the servant of the Lord takes center stage in Isaiah 40 through 55. The servant of the Lord, according to the church in Philadelphia, is Jesus. So the church in Philadelphia has this vision of Jesus, the one with true spiritual authority. And then, of course, it's continued in verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. I'm the one who's unlocking the door for you, and no one can shut it. And the reason is, it's my authority my strength, not your authority and your strength. You have little strength. In other words, we've, we've got a little bit. The, the church has a little bit of power, but it does have power. And with that little bit of power that this seemingly obscure church has had, they have utilized that power in a godly manner. They have utilized that power not for self-promotion or self-ambition, or simply to say, look at me, I have power, as Shebna, who was disqualified in Isaiah 22. No, they've utilized their strength to keep the word of the Lord, to guard that word, to obey that word, to value that word, to promote that word, to make disciples according to that word, and they've not denied his name. See, to keep the word, they've kept the teaching. To not deny the name, they've lived the life. It's not about just teaching. It's not about life. It's about teaching and life. To, to keep the word of God and not deny the name of the Lord means what we teach, we live. Verse 9, of course, says that false covenant people of the Lord will ultimately bow down before the Lord. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come and bow down before your feet to know that I have loved you. They're not going to bow down to Philadelphia. They're not going to bow down to the apostolic and prophetic leadership in the church. There's no bowing down to angels or men in the book of Revelation. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Worship God, Revelation 19.10 says, when it announces that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, it says, right after that declaration is made. The true spirit of prophecy that bears witness to Jesus causes people to bow down at Jesus' feet. Not at oh, my feet, the this, this spectacular minister of the Lord. Not at the feet of a, some kind of a political figure. Not at the feet of any kind of church or church teaching or church doctrine that does not represent the fullness of Christ, just a part of Christ. It's to bow down at the feet of Jesus. And see, see, they, these Jews, the ones who say they're the chosen of the Lord, they're going to bow down at the feet of the church they ruthlessly persecute because they see Jesus in the midst of that church. It's not, it's not about the church at all. Jesus promises to hold and keep 
the church of Philadelphia through the hour of testing. Because you've kept my command to persevere, the little strength they have causes them to persevere in keeping the word and not denying the name of the Lord. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole inhabitable world. You've kept, I will keep. You've kept what I've committed to you, now I will keep you. The book of Revelation is about this trial that's coming on the entire earth. And what happens when the Lord tries an entire humanity? What he does is he brings to the surface what's under the surface. When Jesus declared to his disciples in the Gospels, nothing hidden that won't be revealed, Nothing veiled that won't be uncovered. What you've spoken in the secret places shall be shouted from the rooftops. When Jesus appears, and Jesus is appearing to his churches first and then manifesting himself through his churches and, th and through the entire creation to the earth, when Jesus comes, what is hidden below the surface comes to the surface. It's not that all of a sudden all these things happen. They've, they've, they've been going on. Yeah. Years, generations, centuries. But when Jesus appears, he brings light to everything. The truth is revealed, he's revealed, and the falsehood that's at work in the earth is also revealed. They say they are Jews and are not, they speak falsehood, Jesus says. And when I'm revealed, I'll reveal the truth in who I am. I'm the holy one, I'm the true one, and I'll also reveal where there's falsehood. And see, Jesus brings things to the surface, and what's being brought to the surface is those who are truly his and those who aren't his. What's being brought to the surface are those who truly see the Lord and those who only claim to see the Lord. What is brought to the surface is those who say, we're the chosen ones, when they're not. What's going to be brought to the surface is Jesus is going to stand in the midst of those whom he loves and reveal who the chosen ones are. When, 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 when Jesus comes, heaven opens, and we see the Father, we see the Son, we see the Spirit, we see the angelic host surrounding his throne, worshiping. We see the lamb. We see the lion. We see God's kingdom purposes released. We see human history from a divine standpoint. When Jesus is unveiled, so is the dragon, so is the beast, so is the false prophet, and so is the great harlot. They're all revealed, and so will be revealed the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. So this is what world-shaking trials do. Make no mistake, we are currently in a world-shaking trial. This is why those people who say, oh, covid 19s just fake, COVID-19 isn't as bad as it is, as people are saying. It's a plot. It's a government plot. It's some kind of thing to trick people. Disrespect the Lord. The Lord has released COVID-19, and it's serious. Because he's shaking the earth. That is disrespect to the only one who can do that. The devil can't do these things. The devil, it's like some Christians believe like it's like the devil sets the book of Revelation in motion. They're, they're, they're understanding the book of Revelation is, oh, the devil's coming to deceive everybody. Be careful. Don't do this or don't do that. That's the mark of the beast. But the book of Revelation is not about the devil doing anything. The book of Revelation is about the sovereign Lord. Yeah. 
the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel, the one who alone determines everything that takes place in human history. God does that. He has sent a trial to shake the earth. Well, America's you know, coming out of COVID-19. Well, great that America's come out of COVID-19, but do you know how small part of the globe America is? I mean, we, we, have, we have over 7 billion people in the earth right now. We have about 330 million in the United States. That's a small portion. The Lord and the Lord alone can shake the world. And I respect the sovereign God by saying, you're behind all this, yeah. Lord. And you're behind all this, not because you're causing all this, because you are revealing Jesus. And when Jesus is revealed, everything finds its place in the context of that revelation of Christ. And we're going to, what is being exposed is the spirit of Antichrist in political structures. What is being exposed is the, the, the world being driven by mammon, by profit, profit at any expense. We don't care how many we destroy. We don't care how many we abuse. The bottom line is dollars and cents. What's being exposed is the extreme racialization of human history. It's, just, it's not just about black and white in America. Actually, in America, it's black versus white, indigenous versus white, Hispanic versus white, and who did I miss? Asian versus white. It's, 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 it's about all of those things in this country, but it's way beyond that. There are racial and ethnic controversies in every nation of the earth, and they are, they are conflicts in many cases that predated by thousands of years the racial tensions in America. See, what's going on right now is worldwide, brethren. Get, get, get away from this uh, centralization of Americanism. Uh, it affects us because we're Americans. Of course, it's still very important. But see, this is the trial that has come upon the whole world, and it's going to test those who dwell on the earth. It's a test. But the Lord said, I will keep the church in Philadelphia because they have kept my word. They have not denied my name. They have kept my commandment to persevere. And the commandment to persevere, it's a simple commandment. Hold on, I'm coming. Hold on, I'm coming. Get me Sam and Dave in the background. Hold on, I'm coming. He's coming. Jesus' is coming is not a threat to Philadelphia. It's a promise. Philadelphia holds on, and Jesus promises to come before they lose hold. Quoting some Peter Lightheart here from his commentary on Revelation. Don't blame him for everything I'm saying. I, I'm, 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 I'm getting a, a framework from him. And see, we respect the Lord. I mean, it's so important to understand, no, this thing isn't, what's going on right now isn't something little. It's not something being exaggerated. This is big. This is a key moment in human history. Whether Jesus returns tomorrow or a thousand years from now, it's a key moment in human history for us. This is our hour. And by the way, it's the hour of the boomers and the hour of the millennials. You know, the millennials, 
oh, they don't understand us. The boomers, they don't listen to us. Gen X, just in the middle, trying to hold everything together and being pulled. Being pulled. Thank you, my Gen X brother. Hallelujah. But it's, it's a moment for all of us, brethren. Here's where we're all in unity together. We are all facing the trial that the Lord has sent to test those who dwell upon the earth. Lightheart says the church at Philadelphia is in a situation comparable to that of a restoration church. It, it exemplifies a restoration church. And what he means by that is in the first week I, I demonstrated the number of places where the church in Philadelphia quotes Isaiah, particularly Isaiah 40 through 66, second and third Isaiah, which is the, the prophecy of the return from exile and the restoration of Zion and Jerusalem. So, so Philadelphia is a restoration church. You can keep your hand in Revelation 3 if you want to go to Isaiah 45, uh, but um, we're just going to go there briefly. And if you want to just listen to me, quote it. Jesus is the new Cyrus. He's the one who unlocks and no one can lock, who locks and no one can unlock because he has the authority. And that's similar to what was said in Isaiah 45.1. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. See, Jesus is the new Cyrus. He... The one greater than Cyrus is here. What, if one greater than David is here, David's greater than Cyrus. One greater than David and Cyrus is here. He now has the key. And he's replaced all the guardians who held the keys in the history of Israel. Let me uh, quote Lightheart here. He's got, a, he's got a good quote about that. Jesus is the Holy One. Jesus is the Holy God. Jesus is the Holy Priest. The key of David that he holds is the key to the Holy House of God. Adam was created to be a guardian of the holy place, but when he sins, he's cast out of Eden and the keys of the kingdom go to the angels. The Lord gave the keys to Adam and the woman, the man and the woman. They forfeited those keys when they left. And remember the fiery angel, when they were cast out of Eden, the fiery angel guarding, he was given the keys. Priests are given the task of guarding the house of the Lord in the Old Testament. But human beings are not wholly restored to the original Adamic task until the new covenant. Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to a new Adam, Peter. Matthew 16, I give you the keys of the kingdom, Peter, as a representative of the apostles who all get the keys of the kingdom. And with him, the entire apostolate receives the keys. And with the apostles, the entire church receives the privilege of the keys. We are all guardians of the house because we are the holy ones in the one who is holy. We're holy because he's holy. Jesus, the holy one and the true one as verse 7 states in Revelation 3. In the first century, Jewish leaders who opposed Jesus and the church, the members of the synagogue of Satan in verse 9, Jewish leaders who oppose Jesus and the church forfeit their role as stewards, gatekeepers, and doormen for the house of the Lord. They have been replaced by the true Israel, Jesus, 
who has conferred the power of the keys on his disciples, Jews and Gentiles. Well, that's the picture here in Isaiah 45. And then remember what Isaiah 45, 14, just a little further down in the chapter says. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and those tall Sabaeans, they will come over to you and will be yours. They will be given to Israel. Cyrus is given to Israel. What Cyrus unlocks for what would appear for himself and his political fame and prominence is not for himself and his political fame and prominence. It's for the glory of the Lord. Those political figures, whether they call themselves Cyrus, if they see this power and authority is for themselves, they've already disqualified themselves. It's not for them. It's for God's people, and it's to bring glory to the one who has raised them up and given them power and authority. Those who don't see that move from being a Cyrus to being a beast, okay? And the beast is one of the chief enemies of God's purposes in the church in Daniel 7 and in the book of Revelation. They will come over to you and will be yours. That's his people. They will trudge behind you, coming over to you in chains. They will bow down before you and plead with you, saying, Surely God is with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. See what, what, Rev, what Revelation 3, verse 9 really means when they come and bow at your feet? They're not bowing at your feet, Israel. They're not bowing at your feet, church in Philadelphia. They are bowing down because they say, surely God is with you. There's no other. There's no other God. That is why they will bow down before you. Because one greater than Cyrus is here. One greater than David is here. If we turn back to um, Revelation 3, Verse 11 says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Now notice this thing about no one. It's there twice. It's, it's, it's about someone attempting to steal from the church in Philadelphia what Jesus has granted to them. In verse 8, it says, I know your works. Behold, look, see, I've set before you an open door, no one can shut it. And then verse 11 says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. The open door that God places before Philadelphia is their crown. The open door says, I'm opening the door. You will fulfill your apostolic and prophetic destiny as a church. You will demonstrate who the Holy One is. You will demonstrate who the True One is. You'll demonstrate that though you have little strength, I have the keys. Yes. Yes. So what's, what's, what, what's this point about somebody trying to shut the door that I've opened you? What's this thing about somebody trying to take your crown? Well, that's where we get to the ninth verse. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but speak falsehood. There is a spirit, and that the synagogue of Satan releases a spirit. It releases a spirit that is called here in verse 9 a spirit of falsehood. And earlier... In the message to the church in Smyrna, and look at the church of Smyrna, which is in uh, chapter 2, verse 8. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of similarities between Smyrna and Philadelphia. And what's interesting, there are the two churches that nearly, there's, there's basically nothing stated about Smyrna and Philadelphia that is negative. There are a couple churches of the seven, nothing positive is stated. That's, that's pretty bad. And there are, there are then uh, three other churches that are a mixture, a mixture of good and bad. Again, this is the picture of the fullness of Christ. 
you have, when, when we look at the body of Christ right now, the, the majority of churches have both good and not so good in them. They have areas where they're very successful and they have areas where they struggle. It's mixture. That's, that's the majority of the churches. You have a few churches that are close to perfection, and you have some churches that are very close to having not a single redemptive characteristic. Here's the thing I want you to see. They're all Jesus' church. See, see there, there's this, this mentality in Protestant Christianity, the, the chosen one syndrome. Got to be careful about that. I have no, do, no problem with the teaching or the doctrine of election. It's there in Scripture. You did not choose me, I chose you. But the problem that Israel had through, its entire, through her entire existence is we're the chosen ones, you're not. We're the righteous ones, you're not. We're blessed by God and we want you destroyed because you're not. There is this tendency in human beings to take what is true, what is a blessing, what is a gift from God, and turn it around and make it something dark. First Peter, I believe it's uh, First Peter, let me, let me check it rather than giving one of my, I think it's this, I always know the vicinity that it's in, yes. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this, verse 15, For this is the will of God, this is to the church, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now I want you to see, it does not say, for this is the will of God, that by having the correct doctrines, that by being able to argue well, that by able to win a Facebook battle, <laughs> see, that's all, that's ideology. An ideology without life testimony backing that ideology won't even buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Here's how we demonstrate the testimony of the Lord that silences the ignorance of human beings that make foolish statements about Jesus and the church and the truth by doing good. Yes. Doing good. Yes. Doing good. Performing good. Performing acts that manifest the goodness of God and then it says as those who are Free. You do good as free men, free in Christ, not using your freedom as a cloak for evil, but as the servants of the Lord. See, our freedom comes from the promises of Scripture, and we can take those promises of Scripture, and when there's no life testimony behind it, we can use those promises of Scripture to actually deny the Lord. To, we, could, we can do that to, to abuse the Lord. We can use that to abuse other people. Battering people with truth that is not backed up by action. And see, that's what the synagogue of Satan does. We are the heirs of the word of God. We have the word of God before us. And because we have the word of God, we're the chosen ones, and you're not. And what has happened, and that we have to understand this, it's, it was between Jewish synagogue and church in the first century here. It's, it's not about Jew versus church. It's this group of Christians against that group of Christians. And it's amazing the, that group of Christians who take their pure, holy, true 
doctrines which we have and we have alone, and, and some of the things, of course, they have may be true, but they've already violated the very premise of the seven churches. They say that our church has it all, which is flawed, unbiblical, incorrect thinking. And what they do is, they, it's, it's, it's just, it's so amazing because when you look at the church, one of the churches that, and I'm jumping around to the churches to illustrate this, go to 314, the most confident church, the church to Laodicea, is the one the Lord says, I can't find anything good in what you're doing. And, and it's, it's as if the depths of their degradation only equals their confidence. Yeah. They have these confident assertions and confident uh, uh, declarations, and they, 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 they've mastered their personal self-image. They've got a brand, but it's a spin. And they're so confident. And you got the churches that, that the Lord doesn't say anything bad about. They have little strength. They're being persecuted. The devil's going to throw them into prison. And they're the ones the Lord commends. See, see declarative verbose. In other words, I, I am so confident in everything I say and do as a Christian because I'm one of the chosen ones is, is, is literally, to me, it's almost the kiss of death. The people who are most confident in the body of Christ but yet are unaware of their true state, their nakedness before the Lord, I mean, they're, 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 they've released the spirit of the synagogue of Satan in the body of Christ, and that spirit is an abusive spirit. Look at the Laodiceans. Verse 15 of chapter 3. I know your works. They're not hot or cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. You're, 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 you're not passionate in this direction or passionate in that direction. Your, your, your passion is a false passion. Your confidence is a false confidence. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Look at their self-image. Verse 17, I'm rich. This is what they say. I'm wealthy. I have need of nothing. And the Lord says, and yet, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This church has one thing going for it. It's confidence. And it has no business being confident. See, this is where the spirit of the synagogue of Satan comes. Stop and think of it. Who is one of the most confident entities in the entire universe? The devil's been destroyed by Jesus at the cross, yet he walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Notice it says he walks around as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's actually a 25-year-old cat named Fred who, who, who walks around the house and falls over, pees and poops everywhere, and you wonder why he's even alive. That's a personal family experience that my wife and I know about. One of our family members had Fred the cat. And God bless little Fred. I mean, that cat lived, I, I think, before Fred was put down. He was like about 25. It was amazing. But when you, those last five years of his life, you even wondered, is, is, is he alive or is that like a wind-up toy? But the devil, for all that reality, yeah. lacks no confidence whatsoever. The thing that I have found is in serving the Lord, I'm never confident. What do I mean I'm never confident? I'm, Paul says we are of the circumcision. 
in Philippians, who worship in and by the Spirit of God. See, the circumcision is the mark of the covenant. Philippians 3 says we have three marks. If we're really disciples of Jesus, three things mark us in our new covenant circumcision. It's not a circumcision in the flesh. It's a circumcision of the heart. Our circumcision, these are the signs that we're truly circumcised by the Lord. We worship in and by the Spirit of God. You worship in the Spirit, you worship by the Spirit. What we did today and what we're, we were being exhorted to do as Philip and Janine led worship was, let's worship in and by the Spirit. That's a mark of our circumcision. We second rejoice in Christ Jesus. We don't rejoice in ourselves. We don't rejoice in our doctrines. We don't rejoice in our practices. We don't rejoice in our declarations and our self-image. And we rejoice in Christ. See, our rejoicing is outside of ourselves. It, it, it's, it's not, I, when I look within, there's zero rejoicing. Oh, but pastor, you know, you're, you have a new identity in Christ. Key word, yes, my identity is in Christ. When I look at him, I say, oh, I'm in him. He's fine, I'm fine. Right. When I'm looking at myself, I'm not fine, and I'm never fine. See, this is the secret about being set free from guilt, being set free from fear, being set free from works righteousness. It's, I don't, I don't so what? So, so I can't do anything, so what? So everything I do is, is, is evil, so what? I mean, I see myself as a real Calvinist. I'm waiting for the real Calvinist to act like Calvinist, total depravity. I believe total depravity before I came to Christ, when I came to Christ, since I've come to Christ, and every day that remains till Christ calls me home. Mike Osminski is totally depraved. But Mike Osminski's in Christ. See, I rejoice in Christ Jesus. Everything that Jesus does for us is to remove us out of ourselves and to get us to look at him. Everything. Everything. So that's our covenant marks. We, we worship in and by the Spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. No one, nothing else. And we have no confidence in the flesh. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3. A little bit of confidence in flesh. That's sin, brethren. That's self-righteousness. That's self-exaltation. I don't have any confidence in myself. I don't need to have confidence in myself. Because I live, Jesus says, you will live also. All I have to do is, I'm in the midst of terrible day. All I have to do is say, oh yeah, because he lives, I live also. Next. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Jesus basically says, you're not doing anything right. You're naked. You're blind. But boy, you are confident. So where is that confidence coming from? Well, it's not coming from Jesus. It's not coming from the Father. It's not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's not coming from the Word. So guess where it's coming? From their own heart. And it's falsehood. It is a, it is a narrative of fantasy. The church that reminds me the most of America when I read through the seven churches, it's the Laodicean church. See, see the, the spirit of false prophecy is fantasy. The Laodicean church are living in fantasy. They've created their own holographic world of who they are, and Jesus is saying, let's see, nope, 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 nope. 
You sure are confident in yourself, but nope. And see, brethren, people who have a fleshly confidence and are not even remotely, who do not have even the slightest amount of true character to back their view of themselves are called abusers. That's what an abuser is. I am this, and I am that, and I am this, and you're not. You're what I tell you you're to be. And whatever I decide you are, that's what you are. And what I decide to do to you, I decide, and because everything I do is right, I'm not guilty for anything. In fact, if you accuse me of any wrong, I'm just going to call that a left-wing witch hunt. See, that's my get out of jail card free. I'm the chosen one. Get out of jail free. You're not. Everything I do is right, and what I say is right is right. And what doesn't agree with me is wrong. Get out of jail free card. But it's the denial of the Laodicean church that's rooted in fantasy. It is the spirit behind the synagogue of Satan, which mercilessly persecutes the real church. And again, get, get, get it. There is a church right now in the earth that persecutes the real church. It's Laodicea persecuting Philadelphia, persecuting Smyrna. It's a synagogue of Satan. And that's why Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. He has a, he has a simple, simple, simple word for Laodicean fantasy, repent. And the amazing thing is he will bring them in to his covenant fellowship to fulfill the destiny that they alone can fulfill. Here's the, 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 the difficult, tenuous thing in the body of Christ. Only Laodicea can fulfill Laodicea's purposes. If Laodicea does not repent, then the other six churches, you know, it's like we, 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 we should have eight churches for an eight-cylinder car, or we should have six churches for a six-cylinder car, or four for a four, or whatever. How many know if, if, if one of the cylinders isn't working, that car isn't going to be efficient? So guess what? All the body of Christ can be right with God, and if Laodicea is not doing what Laodicea alone was raised up for by the Lord, what happens to the church? The entire church suffers. This is why, well, I'll tell you what this is why for in a second. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is left outside of the church of Laodicea. Why do you think Laodicea is the way it is? Jesus is on the outside of the church. Pastor, why don't you preach evangelistic messages on Sunday, I am preaching evangelism to the church. We need to get evangelized. We need to let Jesus into our churches. America needs to let Jesus into its church. Jesus is outside, and inside is fantasy, false prophecy, uncleanness, and abuse of the rest of the brothers and sisters in Christ, and abuse that comes from their absolute lack of anything that's of Jesus, and yet an absolute confidence. Back to Smyrna. 
we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up. I'm making my point. Smyrna is very similar to Philadelphia, and that, those are the two churches that the synagogue of Satan is actually referred to. Verse 8 of Revelation 2. These things says the first and last who was dead and came to life. Who was the first and last in Revelation 1? I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. That's Revelation 1.18, and I have the keys. See, Smyrna has the keys. Philadelphia has the keys. They have the keys because they utilize power correctly. Their suffering teaches them how to utilize the keys, the authority of God correctly. They're, the fact that they don't see themselves as some big gift of God to the world, the, we're the only two true tradition, they don't, they don't see themselves as the chosen ones. See, that's the thing about it. This is the thing about election. The chosen ones don't see themselves as the chosen ones. And the ones who really aren't chosen walk around declaring how chosen they are. Let me tell you why. Matthew 25. I, I, was, I was hungry. You fed me. Well done. I was naked. You clothed me. Well done. I was in prison and you visited me. Well done. What, what do those who are receiving the commendation from the Lord say? Uh, when did we do that, Lord? They don't see themselves as the chosen. They're just out there doing good, like 1 Peter says. They just, they, they act like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. They smell like Jesus. They walk like Jesus. And they're like Jesus in that Jesus what does Jesus do? He always effaces himself. The gospel of the self-effacement of the Son of God, John. Oh, I, I'm not doing it. It's my Father in me who does it. I, I don't have anything good to say. It's my Father. Why do you call me good? There's only one who's good. He's in heaven. He's Father. Jesus lives in self-effacement. But I'm telling you, when he, when, when he steps in the room, the demons know who he is. He doesn't have to go in there asserting like Laodicea, I'm the chosen one. He goes in there, he knows who his father is. And because he knows who his father is, the demons know that he knows who his father is. And the demons flee. See, see this is Philadelphia, little strength. Keys, back to closing on Smyrna. Verse 9. See, they, they, they see the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, and Smyrna is valued by the Lord because they pass through death on the life. It's always about resurrection life. They don't make any assertions about themselves. They pass from death to life. I know your works, and here, here are the works that the Lord values. You're afflicted. You're poor. He says, but but you're rich, and here's a work that the Lord commends. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. To be the, the, the recipients of hostility from your own brothers and sisters in Christ who see themselves as the chosen ones, to be the recipients of hostility Notice, it's called falsehood. They speak falsehood in the church in Philadelphia. Here they speak slander. You know what slander is? Slander is when you're told you're this or you're that or you're the other thing. And it's dishonorable. And of course, you're not the chosen of God because we are. You're deceived. You're this. You're that. We're not. The Lord says, no. No. Walking around telling everybody else who's deceived that, they, that others are deceived and they are not is a sign that you're under a different spirit. See, that Facebook spirit, that's, it's constant accusation, but it's, it's an accusation that is exalting yourself. You are this and we're not. Synagogue of Satan is a sign of 
abuse. And abuse, the same abuse that was heaped on Jesus is heaped on Smyrna and Philadelphia. So let's go back to Revelation 3 and close, verse 9, and we'll close. I just, I just, something that's so powerful and profound. You know, we learned early in our church plant, we actually learned it before the church plant, but it was really a driving factor in how we dealt with spiritual warfare at Lord of the Harvest. Come in the opposite spirit. Yes, amen. If somebody comes in a spirit of attack, don't attack back. If they attack you and you attack back, you've just fallen under the same spirit that they're under, and it just increases. When somebody lies, walk, walk in truth. If somebody hates, walk in love. Yes. If somebody bashes you over the head, wash their feet. Yep. Watch this. Watch how the Lord says you're going to deal with the synagogue of Satan. I'll read it first in the New King James, then I'm going to look at it in the Greek. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're the chosen ones, but really aren't, but speak falsehood, but slander you. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. It actually says in the Greek, Behold, I am giving those of the synagogue of Satan. I'm giving them as a gift to you. And when I give them as a gift to you, this is how I'll give them as a gift to you. They will see me, that I'm with you, that I love you, and they will fall at your feet and worship me. Yes. Do you get it here? It's not, and, and brethren, come on, be honest. Somebody attacks you, and in your head is, your day's coming. And maybe you'll, you'll, you'll mouth it, too. It might, it, might, it might go way beyond your heart and your head. It might come out of your mouth. I'm not going to say raise your hand if you've done that. Everybody in the listening audience, yeah. Pastor Oz just raised his hand. In fact, it's almost a constant struggle with me. The things that people say in the body of Christ, this is what I say in my head, you SOB, who the bleep do you think you are? Your day's coming. The Lord's going to get you. And the, the thing is, 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 it's a battle for me. I, I, I've, I've come to realize it's, it's, it's not always just coming from my heart. It's a spirit that's released in the earth right now. It's a spirit that's released in the earth. We're going to get you. And the Republicans have released it. The Democrats have released it. They, they all release it. It's we're going to get you. And, and we're going to get you. There is no redemption in it. And where there's no redemption, there's no grace. Now, it's look, an abuser has to understand that he or she is an abuser and has to confess to being an abuser. I was talking to my wife yesterday. The new walks, she's been retired for two weeks. It's not me, the dog, and Jesus on the road to Emmaus anymore. It's me, the dog, Jesus, and Jan on the road to Emmaus. She's walking daily with with me and Fitz. I said to her, the truth and reconciliation doctrine when apartheid was ended in South Africa, if, if someone came forth, they were called to simply bear witness to the truth. We did this and we did this and we did this, and we did this. And when they declared the atrocities with which the white majority had inflicted upon the African 
the white majority in power, they weren't necessarily the white majority in number, but they were in power. When they would confess it, they were given amnesty. See, that's, that's, that's biblical. And see, people can say what they want about there's, you know, the side that's saying there's no systemic racism and, you know, just wants to deny. And the other side that is pointing out atrocities. I just, I can't believe it. I mean, I think that I have read every book, or at least as many books as I can, that accurately portray the atrocities that this nation has inflicted upon people. I act, and then, then, I, then I, get, I read more. I'm reading one by a Native American, I'm reading one by a Native American brother in Christ right now, and it's just like. <sighs> and then I picked up another one by a, by a black sister in Christ. Just when I think, I, I've, seen, I've heard it all, I've seen it all, new atrocities. But like Laodicea, we can just, with a word of confidence, remove it. Oh, that's not true. It doesn't exist. It's not real. That, that happened hundreds of years ago. And you see the problem there? There's no repentance. It's not repented. To, re to get forgiveness, according to 1 John, you must confess your sin. Yes. And he is faithful, righteous, and just to forgive you of your sin. You have to confess. You deny your sin. He that covers his sin. But here's the thing. Redemption. Redemption. Now, it can also happen that the, 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 the victims who are rightly accusing the victimizers can put them in self, in, themselves into a place yes. where they don't want redemption and they don't want forgiveness. They just want people to pay. Well, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And that has happened in history over and over again. An oppressive government is overthrown by the people who are oppressed, and then the, the, the ones who were oppressed get in power, and they become worse oppressors than the ones they overthrew. See, what's the solution to the synagogue of Satan? Redemption. It's, there's no, and, and, and those people of the synagogue of Satan, those slanderers, those liars, those those, those individuals walking in, in false prophecy, they're going to get theirs. Pastor John opened with that famous quote. I've, it's from Eugenio Corsini, a Catholic priest. Look out. <laughs> a Catholic priest's commentary on the apocalypse. And he said, the Lord gets vengeance on his enemies by converting them. See, the goal for Philadelphia, and this is why Philadelphia is Philadelphia, there's redemption for those who have been abused, and there's redemption for the abusers. And the redemption is to see the one who has loved them. Now, I know that that's a, that's a tough topic. See, this is a tough topic, particularly for those who've been abused, who've been horribly abused. Tough topic. Not every abuser repents. And for those who don't repent, there will be judgment. But our goal has to be that even when we accuse righteously, even when we confront righteously, our goal has to be the hope of redemption. Yeah. The hope of redemption. Yeah. 
And, and just, just, just as we, 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 we understand when we deal one-on-one -on -one with child abusers and sexual abusers and people who abuse verbally and people who abuse by their actions and people who abuse by um, the emotional blackmail that they put on you, we understand to forgive an abuser and see them redeemed does not mean instantaneous resumption of full fellowship. I know all kinds of wonderful, wonderful people who have been healed from the abuse perpetrated on them and they have forgiven their abusers, but they're not, they're not ready to live together with their abusers. Granting redemption and forgiveness simply means that everybody gets back on the right path. And that's a path heading toward Jesus, not away from Jesus. So you can see, and this is why we're, we're only, we're three weeks into Philadelphia and we're only halfway there. When the Lord exploded this revelation about the synagogue of Satan to me, only recently, that the, the language that I'm sharing with you about Philadelphia and the synagogue of Satan has only just been revealed to me in these past months. I just said, wow. I knew the church in Philadelphia was a powerful church, but wow. So those of us who have been a victim, victims of, of the, the demonic abuse from people we trust. And it's not just Christians on Christians, it's family members, family members. I mean, the very people who, who are supposed to be there to create a safe place for us become the habitation of dragons. Philadelphia is a powerful church because the Lord says, ultimately what the Lord's saying to Philadelphia is, in the midst of the abuse from the synagogue of Satan, you kept my word, you've not denied my name, you've kept my command to persevere. You know, another thing that the devil likes to do is you begin to project the abuse from your abusers onto God. And then you start seeing God as the abuser. Well, well if, 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 if God is there to be our father? Why did he allow the abuse? Well, can I ask you this? Why did he allow it to happen to Jesus? What happened to Jesus? Redemption. Jesus suffered for all those who were unwilling to suffer, that those who were unwilling to suffer might receive the grace of God to turn to the Lord. It's, it's like Paul saying, I'm in prison now, I'm afflicted, but I'm filling up what is lacking of the affliction of Christ in the church. I'm suffering for those who cannot yet suffer, who are unable to suffer, or who are unwilling to suffer. And again, I've stated this, and I'll state it again to my leaders in the body of Christ, to the future leaders in the body of Christ. The hallmark of leadership is the willingness to suffer for others. Do I really have what it takes to be a pastor? Do I really have what it takes to be a prophet or an apostle or a teacher or an evangelist? Do I really have what it takes to be a minister in the house of God? Well, here's the answer to that question. Do you have the willingness and the inner capacity to suffer? Then the answer is yes to any of the above. And see, Philadelphia was willing to suffer while God worked out his love toward them that it might be released yeah. toward others, including the very ones causing the suffering. Yeah. You've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who persecute you. Pray for those who misuse you and victimize you that you might be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. For he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. Everybody, it's, you know, rain is a bad thing in an industrialized society. We don't want light. Yeah, God, you know, he sends the just and the unjust both get bad things. No, this is an agricultural society. Rain is a good thing. The more it rains, our crops succeed and we live. He sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Wow, Philadelphia, what an incredible church. And it doesn't, the Lord doesn't even commend them by saying, they'll bow at your feet because they'll see the love you have for them. No, it's because it's not about their love for others. It's about Jesus loving the church in Philadelphia and making them lovers. So see, when you battle with that, I'm going to tell so-and-so, such-and-such, you're going to get yours. Oh, I'm answering that crap on Facebook. Oh, you, you call me deceived. When you look at delusion in the dictionary, your picture's there. <laughs> and see, when you remain silent and pray, in fact, when you not only remain silent, but maybe you open your mouth and you bless where you're being cursed. See, the love of Jesus. The only, the, see, only the people, again, and, and, and again, I'm, saying, I'm waiting for the Calvinist to become as Calvinist as I am, and I'm not a Calvinist. See, that's what real grace is. See, real grace gives you the power to do what no human being on their own can do, to love and forgive those who have mistreated them horribly. And I took a long time here, but gosh, Philadelphia is so important. We'll close. Father God, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. One of the five original words that you gave this house, church in Philadelphia. Can't say that we are yet, but we're striving to be that, Lord. And, and, and in striving, in striving to be the church in Philadelphia. Love us, Lord, into loving you. Love us, Lord, into loving our enemies, Lord. And then give the very ones that abuse us. Give them to us as a gift when they are converted. Oh, Lord, we're here to just... God, if we're a storehouse church, it's because we have something for those in the midst of the famine, Lord. We have something to give them, Lord. Something to give them that will preserve their lives in the midst of a very dark and difficult time, a trial that comes to try the whole inhabitable earth. Grant it unto us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.